I must apologize for my lack of uh, voice simply because I haven't been feeling well recently. So tonight or this afternoon, my special guest is Mobin Musa, an attorney who's previously appeared with us. He's an attorney practicing in the area of commercial law under the name and style of Mobin Musa Attorneys in Santon. Mobin, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nice to be back on the show and thank you for having me, Ashraf. Welcome, Mobin. Now, just for this afternoon, we intend to make it an open line. So any question that you have that you want to find out about the law on any particular topic, you're welcome to call in. And as usual, our telephone numbers, which will also appear on your screen, is 011-086-77-01-2 stroke or 3. Now, Mobin, in terms of uh, your area of law, commercial law, it's a vast topic, really. It's very vast, as a matter of fact, yes. But most people understand commercial law to mean intricate transactions and uh, you know, uh, lots and lots of people, but it's not really that. Uh, am I right? W what is commercial law? Well, commercial law is merely the, the legal system in place meant to regulate dealings between either private individuals amongst themselves or uh, co corporate entities and private individuals or the state and private individuals or, or corporate entities as well. Um, it, it's, it's basically, it's a set of rules. Okay. So in a simplistic, in a, let's say the, the uh, everyday transaction, that is also a commercial transaction. So it's, it's not something that is, uh, you know, very, very difficult to understand. An ordinary purchase and sale transaction is a commercial transaction. Absolutely, yes. You go to the supermarket, you buy a liter of milk, it's not right. It, that is a commercial transaction. That's and you have is. rights flowing from that. And the seller has got obligations flowing from that. Now, it's very interesting that the South African legal system allows for ordinary people to be able to take their matters to various bodies. The Consumer Council, there are other, uh, there are other bodies, for example, the Small Claims Court. But before I come to that, I understand we have a caller on the line. Caller, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. My name is Maimuna. Yes, Maimuna. I've got a question about marriages, etc. Yes. I want to know if Islamic marriages are recognized, firstly. Yes, Maimuna. Because it's, I think it's a myth that people think the South African government actually recognizes our marriages, but it does not. Am I correct? I mean, let me try and answer the question. Okay, okay, Ma. In, Before you go ahead, yes. my actual question is then, I'm in a civil marriage, and I'm in marriage it's in, in um, what we call it Nikah. now, Islamic law. Yes. yes. So, if I was to be get divorced, um, would um, I have to go to court also? And I have to obviously go to our uh, ulama here. Am I correct in saying so? That's my question, Shukran. I will listen on television for an answer. Okay, Maimana, thank you for a very, very interesting opening question. Let's just sketch the legal scenario. South African Muslim marriages are not recognized. Now, there's been a long process to try and get their marriages recognized. Let me qualify that statement by saying there isn't a law saying we are recognizing marriages. However, there's been a development over a period of time since this young democracy where Muslim marriages were recognized in certain instances. For example, inheritance, where there was a de facto wife according to Islam, married according to Islamic rights. And the testator would then say, I leave it to my wife. And somebody would oppose that and say, but she's not your wife because the legal system said Islamic marriages, potentially polygamous unions, were not recognized. But there's been a whole development in the legal system, lots and lots and lots of cases. 
the most recent step towards recognizing Muslim marriages was a rollout by the Department of Home Affairs of about a hundred trained marriage officers or imams that had the power of marrying a Muslim couple and giving them a marriage certificate in terms of the Civil Marriages Act. So that Islamic marriage, so-called, now became a civil marriage. Of course, the checks and balances had to be there. These imams would ask that the parties come with an anti-nuptial contract because a marriage according to the laws of Sharia or Nikah is that this is a separation of the estates. What is the husband's is his, what is the wife's remains hers. Part two of your question. So there's a historical development towards recognition, but the Muslim personal law, Muslim personal bill is still not settled. That's another debate. Now, you're a woman married according to the civil law. In terms of the civil law, only a civil court can dissolve that marriage. Is that right, Mobin? That's absolutely correct. Now, in terms of civil divorce, please tell Memuna how well, she should do it. Well, there's many, many different aspects involved. Um, primarily, you need to ask yourself, are you married in terms of an anti-nuptial contract or married in terms of a, a marriage in community of property? Are there any minor children involved? Will there be uh, any maintenance requirements for either minor children or for an ex-spouse, man or woman? Um, all of these things need to be considered. All of these things need to be discussed between the parties. If, uh, if agreement can be reached on all such points, it would be the easiest way in which to, to get divorced. An agreement of settlement can be made and adopted in the form of an order of court um, where there is um, a, a reason to litigate uh, uh, any dispute arising from the divorce. Uh, if, for example, the parties were married in community of property and one party would request a division of the joint estate, meaning each party is entitled to half of the joint estate, and another party would dispute that ba based on the other parties being guilty or at fault for the breakdown of the marriage. Um, and, and instead of requesting a division of the joint estate, that party who is disputing it would probably request that uh, the court makes an order whereby the other party forfeits the patrimonial benefits of the, the joint estate. Um, nonetheless, there, there are many different aspects, but yes, as, as a Muslim lady, as I should have quite correctly pointed out, you have a civil marriage in South Africa and that can only be dissolved through a civil court. And part two, Memuna, is you then turn to the religious authorities in your area and whether you have the power of Hula or Fasak, which is the power that you retain at the time of the Nikah to dissolve the marriage, and that is a different discussion in terms of the Sharia, you may be able to approach them and ask them, my civil marriage is divorced, I have a court order, he has maintenance obligations. I now request a dissolution of my nikah and let that process take its own course. So the answer is Muslim marriages are not recognized in law. However, there's been given practical recognition in the courts almost daily. Now the Department of Home Affairs also taken out uh, a further step in assisting Muslim marriages to be recognized by deploying hundred specially trained ulama, I think in Cape Town and KwaZulu-Natal. And uh, the, uh, the uh, divorce has to take place in the civil court, as Mobin has pointed out. Very importantly, if there's minor children, the Family Advocates Office, which is a free service, has to be consulted because irrespective of what the parties decide, in our, in our law, the High Court is the upper guardian of all minor children, right, Mobin? That's correct. That they can correct. make their own rules, even yeah. if you don't like it. Absolutely. If you, if you approach a judge yeah. and present a, a proposed agreement of settlement to be made into an order of court, most instances where there, is, where there are no disputes and the judge is, the judge is satisfied that the, 
the, the, the rights and, and, and the, uh, the, the, the caretaking of the minor children has been satisfactorily addressed in your proposed agreement of settlement, then uh, there's a very, very small chance that a judge would interfere. But if they do if feel uncomfortable for any slight reason whatsoever, your matter will be referred by order of court to the offices of a family advocate. And uh, the offices of the family advocate will have to appoint one of the internal social workers to interview each minor child, each party in the marriage, um, so as to provide their written recommendation to a judge before he makes a final order. Mimina, I hope that answers your question. If you still need further clarification, you may call us again. I mean, we're talking about the lowest court uh, or the means of addressing um, uh, a particular issue in a uh, commercial transaction. We spoke about milk that you bought. That wasn't right. So you have certain rights there. But let's say most people understand that litigation is expensive. That's correct, yes. And litigation is extremely lengthy and it's complicated and people are afraid of going to court. But we have this very interesting uh, institution called uh, the Small Claims Court. Yes. Now those are to adjudicate disputes. It's actually a court where you appear but without attorneys. And you are entitled to go if you have a claim up to 15,000, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, what is the process? What, what should people do if you have a... Let's say now I bought, I asked you to... I asked a particular person to come and do my plumbing. He charged me eight and a half thousand. It's not right. I'm unhappy. I have various recourses. One of the recourses, I want my money back. Absolutely. So and now what would I do? Let's assume you, quite correctly, you, you went to a, a plumber. He came to your home. He gave you a price for which you paid him and the work is not satisfactorily completed. Um, you then realize that suing somebody for eight and a half thousand rand, you've got to approach an attorney, pay for a consultation, uh, get him to do what needs to be done, etc., etc. Before, not, not before long, your fees have escalated to uh, Far more than the amount you're claiming. Uh, absolutely. So and, that and, it creates a hardship. It doesn't become economically viable for the claimant. Right. Um, that's why you have an institution like the Small Claims Court, which has a monetary jurisdiction of up to 15,000 rand. Which act what that actually means is that you can pursue any claim to the maximum value of 15,000 rand in a Small Claims Court. Anything over and above 15,000 rand yeah. will have to be pursued in a magistrate's court. Bobby, just p uh, pause there. We have another call on the line. Please go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, my daughter has been divorced for a, over a year. Uh, in fact, she got divorced while she was pregnant. And the father never bothered to see the child or any. He hasn't assisted her with anything of the child or anything. What right has he got over the child? Bobin, what the caller is asking is the obligation of maintenance. How is that different from no. the right of visitation? I'm talking about a right from the father's side on visiting. Understand. He hasn't, your point is that he hasn't been there and no, he hasn't supported. Been. Does he have any rights? Now, there's a difference. The two rights are different. So, Mubin, unpack that, please. Not a problem. When it comes to your, well, if I understand your question correctly, the rights of the father to see and visit the child, yeah. despite the fact that he has not attempted to do so since the birth of the child, that is unaffected. His rights to visit the child are unaffected by that. He still, by law, is entitled to see his child as and when it is reasonably convenient or suitable. Um, not be, being not being the custodian parent, obviously he is subject to the bounds of reasonability. He cannot pitch up at odd or unreasonable hours of the day or night, or unannounced or unexpected, and make demands, etc. Um, but he is within reason entitled to access and care and custody of the child, um, unless, of course, 
you can show any good ground or cause or reason as to why he should not be entitled to access to the child, either supervised access or unsupervised access. Uh, in the absence of any such reason or ground, the father is entitled to visit and see the child. At that point, you must understand why we started by saying, irrespective of whether he's paid or not, or whether he's come or not, the right is intact. Right, Mubin? That's correct. So you cannot say, I'm not allowing you to see this child because you didn't pay, you didn't come, and you didn't support. That right is intact. You must pursue the rights that you have for maintenance. Past? No, no, no. I understand the pursuing of the right from maintenance is a different issue. But yeah, the father hasn't bothered to come and see the child at all. Uh, suddenly, he make a call to say, I'd like to see the child. Can you bring the child to a shopping center? He's not prepared to come to the child's house to see the child. Well, he's now exercising his rights to access. Now, the question is, how is that right of access to be exercised? If it's in the child's interest not to be taken to a shopping center, you don't have to comply. Right, Mubin? Absolutely. Like I said, it's, it is rights to access are all subject to a thing called reasonability. And if it's, for example, cold outside or raining and it's not, it's not conducive towards taking a, a child out in, in bad weather to go to a shopping center, if he is insisting to exercise his rights of access at that point in time, it would only be reasonable for the father to come to see the child at the child's home where there's no risk of... of, of illness or otherwise. Um, the right of access is there, it's intact, it hasn't been uh, removed, it can only be removed by order of court and in the absence of which it is there and it will remain there but must be exercised within the confounds of the concept of reasonability. Does that clear it for you, Kola? Mm, it, it does clear it for me but what I can't seem to get understand or to get it is uh, if the father doesn't bother about the child at all, in, 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 the, in, in the one year he has seen the child uh, for plus minus 24 hours, completely in, in, in the whole year, I'm, I'm saying the time frame is 24 hours. I, I think you need to get your head around this. He has a right. If he didn't exercise the right, he has a right, if he didn't exercise the right, you can't say he shouldn't exercise the right. Yes, he wasn't there for 12 months, but now he's there. It's a right, he'll access it, it has to be reasonably accessed. It has to be in the interest of the child as well. He can't just say, do this, do that. The best way to deal with this is to have a proper structured access agreement. Is that right? Very true. It's best that the parties agree on the times when the access of the father or the non-custodian parent will be exercised. In most cases, it's most commonly every alternate weekend, alternate Father's Days, uh, alternate Father Days, alternate Eid Days, alternate Christmas Days, and you know birthdays, that, birthdays and that sort of thing as well. Um, these things are usually structured in the form of a written agreement, and in cases where they are there are disputes or if there is an unclarity or one party pitches up and tries to exercise their right on a, on a Wednesday afternoon when the agreement stipulates only on the weekends, the, the, the agreement between the parties can always be referred to and said, but this is what we agreed to stick to. And for the sake of clarity between the parents who are no longer in, in, a, in a relationship, in a marriage with each other, um, it's best to have a written agreement that regulates the way in which access will be exercised by the non-custodian parent. Okay, if you have an agreement and he doesn't adhere to that, then what? Well, if you have an agreement, the question is, is that agreement already made into an order of court? And if not, it should be made into an order of court so that it can be enforced. If it's not made into an order of court, it's, it's impossible to enforce it because how, how would you enforce something like that? Because it you just can't, because only an order of court is enforceable. Well, not necessarily. Normal, normally contracts are, and uh, this is a form of contract nonetheless. Mm. And, it, and the, it, it would be enforceable, but you would have to first go through the litigation process to get an order allowing you to, uh, to enforce that con 
agreement. But if the agreement is already made into an order of court... It's easier, that's what you're saying. It's ten times easier, mm -hmm. not just easier, but a lot easier, and can be enforced uh, literally over the counter. Okay, you're welcome. Pleasure. And now, viewers, please stay tuned. We're going for a short ad break. We'll be back after the break. And welcome back to the second half of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. This afternoon, my very special guest is Mobin Musa, an attorney practicing in the field of commercial law in Johannesburg. Mobin, just before the calls, we were talking about this uh, process in the small claims court. And we were saying that if you have a claim between two natural people or between a natural person and a company, so a company can't go to the small claims court as a plaintiff. You go, you go there and you have a claim for 15,000 rents. Up so to, what happens? Up to a maximum. Up to 15,000. It, it could be less than 15,000 as well. That's right. Um, well, the procedure is very simple. You would approach your closest magistrate's court in, in whichever district that you reside. Um, you will then speak to the clerk of the court and advise him that you intend to process a claim in the small claims court. Um, the clerk of the court will direct you to the to the correct officers and assist you in completing the required forms and other documentation. Uh, from that point on, your claim will then be discussed, quantified, etc., and a letter of demand will be sent to your intended defendant. Um, th that is, in, if your claim is subject to a credit agreement or the, the National Credit Act, etc., um, a letter of demand will be forwarded to your intended defendant. The period in your letter of demand will have to expire before a summons can be issued and served. Um, most letters of demand today uh, are 14-day letters of demand. Uh, once the period does expire, the clerk of the court will assist you in finalizing and completing a summons together with a particulars of claim um, and to get it delivered and served by way of sheriff or, in some cases, registered mail upon the intended uh, defendant. The, the clerk of the court will include in the summons the date on which yourself as the plaintiff as well as the defendant are required to appear at court in order to deal with your claim. Moment before you go on the appearance, sure. we have another caller on the line. Caller, please go ahead. So, Mobin, sorry, we, he'll come back to us. Now, the actual appearance in the small claims court, we were at that point. Continue. Um, once we reach the stage where the matter is ripe for hearing or the, the date on which you are required to appear has arrived, you are not entitled to any kind of legal representation in the small claims court. You will have to represent yourself and so will the defendant or the other party. Um, so it's a bit like that night court that you see on TV where you have to go with your witnesses and your documents and you have to explain, right? It's actually very much like that. And as a matter of fact, it, this does take place at night. Uh, our small claims courts run after uh, working hours to accommodate people who have to spend the, their entire days at work and will not have time to access courtrooms. You're quite right in that. Um, the one in Johannesburg based in Hillbrow Magistrates Court. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. So you go after hours, your matter is called, and you actually your own attorney, and you and you speak your mind, and you say what needs to be said, and you bring your proof. That's right. You fight your you fight your own case. If you if you're claiming, um, we used an example of a plumber. Yeah. And if assuming you paid him eight thousand rand, if mm. he gave you a receipt, you will display your receipt. If he didn't give you a receipt and you paid him via EFT, you will display your proof of payment or whatever it might be. Um, if if you're saying that he fixed a pipe that was meant to stop leaking, and but the pipe is still leaking, you can take a picture on your cell phone and right. and and display that picture at at the small claims court to say, look, this is a picture of the pipe that is still leaking, and you can see the water flowing and the damage being caused, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The plumber also will not be entitled to any legal representation. Will not in the small claims court. No one's allowed to have an attorney, so he will have to 
to give his side of the story leading his own evidence as well, um, either by using also document, documentary evidence. Um, he, can, he could display a picture that was taken before he did his work and the picture of after, showing, mm. showing whatever steps that he took and whatever remedies that he... That right. he so it's a very informal process. The, it is, as a matter of fact, and, and the nice part about it yeah. is that the presiding officer yes. is, a, is an, a practicing attorney. Right. The, 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 the small claims court... Um, the, is so the judge, basically, he's yes. an attorney, right? He's That's a correct. commissioner. They call him the commissioner, right? That's correct, yes. So he, and he sits there, and, and he's interested in listening to quick, informal justice, no legal trickery and uh, objections... Well, I mean, we have to pause here. There's a call on the line. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. To you too. Uh, I've just got, I've, I've listened to this, your last call of yours. Yes. Go ahead. I've been listening to this last call of yours. He's been complaining about uh, the child's father not coming for 12 months, blah, blah, blah. But uh, you see, patience is virtue. My dad always said, patience is sweeter than honey. So uh, let it happen whatever, you know. If the father wants to come and visit the child or what, allow him. Islamically, you, you know, he's got the right. And as much as your heart is bleeding, you have to make sabar. Okay. Well, thank you for your advice. I'm sure the listener will appreciate it. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. So, Mubin, here we, here we were talking about a process that's fleshed out in open court. Parties are themselves. Presiding officer is there. He's a trained attorney or an advocate. He's a commissioner. And you put your case to him. Now, what, what, could, what could transpire? He could, he could do what from there? He could... Well, well, well uh, the, the presiding officer, the commissioner of the small claims court, is, like you said, trained. He is professional. He is seasoned in this sort of thing. He is properly equipped in all, in, uh, for purposes of making a just ruling, for seeking a the best possible outcome of the dispute between the parties involved. If he, if he takes into account the case that the plaintiff puts forward, and the case that the defendant puts forward and applies his mind to the, to the evidence that's, that's been presented, um, he will then have to make a ruling. Like you said, it's quick and it's informal. Yeah. Um, so it, it, he, he will be equipped to make a ruling pretty much over the counter. Um, and he, once he does make his decision, his decision is final and binding upon both parties. So um, it's a judgment. Basically. Absolutely. That's precisely yeah. what it is. It's, it's, as a matter of fact, it's quite enforceable as well. And the very important thing, Mubin, is the thing that people are scared about in litigation is costs. Yes. Now, in the small claims court, there's no, there's no fear of costs because you represent yourself. Absolutely. Your costs cannot escalate when you're in, in, in control of what, what you're spending here. Um, you, if, you, if you haven't briefed an attorney who's gone ahead and incurred disbursements on your behalf and briefed the counsel, etc., um, there are no co actual costs to be incurred over and above that. Save the costs of your letter of demand plus your sheriff's costs, which I think you could get back if you say, let's say that um, commissioner fines for the plaintiff and says, okay, 8,000 rands plus the cost of your letter, th those small costs that you put out. He's not going to pay you for your petrol and your telephone calls. You know, most, most people no. uh, want all of the costs back, right? Yes, unless, unless they, your other disbursements qualify as damages for which you have got a, a successful judgment, it's, you will not recover such costs. But the costs that you will be entitled to recover are the actual legal costs that you would otherwise have incurred by um, visiting an attorney's offices. Okay. Um, after this caller, we're going to call, we're going to speak of how to enforce that, right? Let's say Mr. Plummer doesn't pitch up, now you get a judgment. But we have a caller on the line. Caller, go ahead, please. Is that me now? Yes, that's you. Okay. But you said I must wait. Please go ahead, you're on air. All right. 
Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I just needed to ask where is the small claims court? Are there different small claims court in different regions? Every uh, city. Where is it physically? Every city has a magistrate's court. But every magistrate's court doesn't have a small claims court. If you live in a big place like, like Johannesburg or Cape Town, it's usually an office in the magistrate's court. Oh, and do we have to pay? No, you pay, it's free. You pay nothing. And uh, one last question, do I have to make an appointment? No, you go in. Usually the queues are quite long because most people want to have their claims adjudicated quickly and easily. You sit there, you get to the clerk of the small claims court, there's a clerk, he'll yeah. give you a documentation called a letter of demand. Okay. You then take the letter of demand, you might even be able to, I think you can download the letter of demand uh, from the Department of Justice website. Okay. That's your first step, your letter of demand. So you write to this person, you put their names, you say what amount you're claiming, and then you say why. So in the why section you say, on this day, I borrowed you a hundred rand. You meant to pay the hundred rand back by that day. You have not paid, I now demand my hundred rands, for example. Okay. That's your claim. You post it, you keep your proof of postage, your registered slip. Do I send the original? You see how you send the original and you keep okay. a copy. You keep your okay. postage slip. After yeah, 14 okay. days, you go back to the clerk of the small claims court, right, Mubin? Yeah, that's correct. And then? Um, if you haven't gotten any response to your demand within the time period, you go back to the clerk of the small claims court, you advise them that this is the letter of demand which has gone by uh, without any response, and the clerk of the court will then assist you with the issuing of the summons and, and getting it served or delivered on the defendant. May I ask another question? Please. Please feel free. I just want to know what is the limit to this uh, money? I mean, uh, in the small claims court, you're entitled to pursue any claim up to a maximum amount of fifteen thousand rand. One five. That's correct. Fifteen thousand. One yes. five. Okay. Now let's say somebody owed you sixteen thousand. Yeah. You you drop the one thousand and you go oh. for fifteen instead of paying an attorney to go for in the magistrate's court which is scales between uh, z uh, zero and seven thousand as the lowest scale. But your, your, you know your attorney's cost would outstrip your, your entire benefit. So therefore, if you owed 16 or 17, you drop the two and you go for 15. All right. That's a lot of help, but thank you so much. You're absolutely you welcome. Thank you so much. Alaikum salam wa rahmat. And now viewers, it's time for another short break. Please stay tuned. We'll meet you after this short break. Welcome back to the last segment of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Now, this afternoon, we're talking about general commercial transactions. And my very special guest is Mobin Musa. But it's an open line. You're welcome to call on any topic. Mobin, just before the break, we were speaking about now the process is over in the small claims court, right? The commissioner has now made a judgment or has dismissed the claim. Now, let's say Mr. Plummer decides I'm not coming. Doesn't matter. What happens now? If, if, for example, there's a judgment in favor of you or the plaintiff against the plumber and that judgment is in the form of uh, a monetary judgment yes. or, 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 or an order for the plumber to actually come back and remedy defective workmanship. What we call specific performance. Specific yeah. performance is correct. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the manner in which you would go about enforcing a monetary judgment, for example, is quite simple. Um, if the judgment has been granted and you've received no positive response or feedback from the plumber um, who is aware of the judgment against him, he's not come forth, he's not made good on it. For example, if the, the presiding officer, the commissioner of the small claims court has ordered that he's got to refund you the 4,000 rand which you may have paid him, 
and he has not complied with that order, mm. you can then go back and approach the clerk of the small claims court and advise him that you've got this judgment for 4,000 Rand in your favor, which you need to get enforced because the judgment data has not complied with. Maybe I'll just ask you to pause there, please. Sure. We have a call on the line. Go ahead, please. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, Ramadan Karim to you guys, and I would just like to pose a question, please. Please go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, about three years ago, right, the company that I worked for, they closed down, they were liquidated. Right? Everything was handed over to lawyers and stuff like that. But now it's three years later that we haven't heard anything from them. Nothing. So, I mean, there was still back pay from uh, about 40-odd workers, and, you know, all that was due was obviously the... You know the incentives that was then due, but nothing has come through as yet. What do I, what, 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 what can I do, or how do I go about it to contact them? Because I have contacted them in the past, but uh, I've got, I've actually got no joy out of it. Okay, basically, when a company is liquidated, liquidators are appointed by the master of the high court, right, Mubin? Absolutely correct. Now, what happens from there? Well, assuming you know who the liquidator is, you most welcome and entitled. You're, you're clearly an interested party because you're an ex-employee of a liquidated entity um, with certain rights, which I will get to in a minute. But you can approach the liquidators, the duly appointed liquidators, and at any time and ask them for a progress report or an update as to how far down the line of formally um, finalizing the liquidation they may actually be. And if they have managed to reach a point where they've drafted their first and final liquidation and distribution account, um, which will set out all the claims in favor of the liquidated entity and all the claims against the liquidated entity, which will set out whether or not there's a surplus of funds or at the end of it all or not. So salaries and commissions is a claim against the company. The liquidator must be approached. If you don't know who's the liquidator, Go to the um, uh, master of the high court in your area. There's an, an, uh, there is an office of the master of the high court. It doesn't sit in the high court. Eh? It's a separate okay, so, yeah. master so of the high court. Case. You yeah. give him the case, the names of the parties. Say this is the, he'll check it up for you. He'll say Mr. X is the liquidator. You go to Mr. X. Mr. X, I'm an employee. My salary was not paid. My commissions are not paid. As Mubin said, what is the status of the company, right, Mubin? Absolutely. Now, yeah. you must file a claim. Say, listen, I want my name on the people that you'll pay. If you're paying 10 cents in a rent, I want to be a beneficiary of that 10 cents in the rent. How long does, if I'm not sorry, how long does it usually take? Okay. That is a very difficult that, question. That, that varies, yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't, don't we have a more, more or less, a, um, you know, approximate time? Or... Look. It depends on the assets and liabilities. You know, some of these yeah. mining companies, you remember Aurora and things, yeah. the liquidation went on yeah, for yeah, a very, yeah. very long yeah. time. Yeah. And what had happened is assets, you know, assets had to be collated and liquidators had to be, uh, they, you know, they had to be called to book. So, yeah. so at the end of the day, it's unknown the length of time. What you need to do is you need to be proactive. If yeah. you're unhappy, with the liquidator, you make a complaint to the master. Say, look, Mr. Master, I went to the liquidator on this day. Here's my notes. Here's my diary. These are questions. Okay. He's not giving... The master is entitled to remove the liquidator. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good luck a lot for you guys. Eh? You've been a great help. I'll reward you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for phoning. I think, I think it's worthy to mention that an employee... A claim for against a liquidated company in favor of an employee is actually one of the preferent claims. Preferent. That means you're almost in the same basis as a bank, right? If, uh, well, as a, as a, a bank is a, a secured, preferred creditor. secured creditor, right? Uh, but uh, you, I think, I think the, the, the hierarchy or the chain is first your, your SARS claims and then your, your employees, right. if I'm not mistaken. So it's a very high-ranking claim. It's a very high-ranking claim and it will take preference over other claims. Of trade creditors. Trade creditors, for example, yes. Yeah, so please pursue it. I mean, just to wrap up now, finally, you know, sure. we've running, we're running out of time. Uh, right, so Mr. Plummer doesn't come. you now got this thing called the writ, right? And you give it to the sheriff. Now what happens? Well, the sheriff of the court is entitled to execute service of the writ of execution uh, upon Mr. Plummer, uh, either at his business or home, 
wherever he, he may be, uh, the sheriff is entitled to attach movable property from the plumber to the value of your claim, including the costs, the cost of the sheriff and the cost it would take to effect such service. What, when the sheriff makes an attachment, doesn't mean you will remove the, the, the attached goods. What it means is that he places certain goods in, in, uh, under what is known as judicial attachment. Um, it's, it's sort of like a warning for, for the judgment creditor to make good on the judgment debt, failing which the attached goods will then be removed and sold at an, uh, by way of public auction. So basically he can come in, he says, Mr. Plummer, these are all your tools. He makes a note, one screwdriver, ten, whatever. He puts a value to it. He says, now, look, this is judicially attached. You can't remove it. You can't touch it. You can't work with it. Can't if you do, it. you can't sell it. If you do, it's a criminal offense as well. That's a crime, yes. So therefore, you pursue your rights. And then if he still doesn't pay you, the sheriff is entitled to remove. But you've got to now, now pay the sheriff to remove. Mobin, unfortunately... We've now once again run out of time, but it's been a very, very interesting and fruitful discussion. It's been a pleasure. Thank you and for having me. Thank you, you know, for having made your time available. I know time is very, very valuable. And to our valuable uh, viewers, thank you for tuning in and giving us feedback from your calls with your calls. And please keep tuned to us to Legal Ease next week, where we intend to bring you some very, very vibrant uh, questions regarding certain international issues. Um, once again, Mubin, I, I uh, thank you for having come in here um, uh, to our control staff as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.